This is one of the most dramatic and most photographed views in all the world. It's the iconic image of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the spectacular Sydney Opera House. There's no other building in all the world like the Sydney Opera House. It's one of the great buildings of the 20th century. It's an architectural masterpiece with its unique gleaming white roof of interlocking vaulted sail-shaped shelves. It's Australia's best known landmark. But it's not well known that the land where the Opera House sits is known as Benelong Point. It's named after a man of the Eora tribe, an Aboriginal Koori people, the original inhabitants of this country. Benelong was a local Aborigine who served as a liaison between Australia's first British settlers and the local population. He was the first Aboriginal man to visit Europe and return. Benelong lived in a small building on this site that now carries his name. Then in the early 1800s, the New South Wales governor, Lachlan Macquarie, instructed that a large, impressive stone fort be built on the site to protect the new colony. By 1902, the stone fort was replaced by a tram depot and then a bus terminus and finally the Opera House. Beside the Opera House, you can still see the heritage-listed jetty built in 1810 called the Man of War Steps. For 150 years, the Man of War Steps were the landing and embarkation point for men of the British and Australian fleets. Right by the steps are the beautiful Sydney Harbour Botanical Gardens that wrap around the small inlet called Farm Cove. It was here that the early settlers planted the first crops to feed the struggling new colony. On the other side of the Opera House is Sydney Cove, the heart of the city. Today it's better known as Circular Quay, a tourist precinct, a transport hub for the harbour ferries, hydrofoils and river cats, and the historic Rocks Heritage Area. But now, let's step back in history about 250 years. In late 18th century Britain, the Industrial Revolution caused widespread economic displacement. As new machines were invented, people were no longer needed to do farm jobs. So people flocked to the cities looking for work. The cities became overcrowded. The unemployment and poverty in the overcrowded cities saw the crime rate rise dramatically. Desperate people turned to petty crime just to survive. Soon, Britain was struggling to accommodate its prisoners as the jails became increasingly overcrowded. Then, under English law, criminals were transported to penal colonies. At first, British prisoners were sent to the colonies in North America. But in 1783, when the American War of Independence ended, the newly formed United States refused to accept any further shipments of British convicts. As a result, prisons in Britain were soon overflowing again. The situation became dire and an alternative was needed. So the British government decided that the vast southern continent claimed for Britain by the explorer Captain James Cook in 1770 would be an ideal location for a new penal colony. It seemed a great idea to transport your prisoners to the other end of the world. The first fleet of 11 ships carrying more than 750 prisoners, or convicts as they were called, departed Portsmouth, England on the 13th of May, 1787. After a voyage lasting 252 days and covering 20,000 kilometers, they arrived in this cove on the 26th of January, 1788. It was the beginning of an era of transporting British prisoners to Australia. Between 1788 and 1868, 
in just 80 years. About 165,000 convicts were transported from Britain and Ireland to various places in Australia. The newly arrived convicts faced many challenges. They were isolated from their family and friends. They were transported to a distant and alien land. They arrived despised and disadvantaged. Their lives were filled with adversity and toil. Yet in spite of their hardships and handicaps, many rose above the challenges, worked hard, gained their freedom eventually, and not only succeeded in proving themselves to be upright and reliable citizens of their new land, but also contributed enormously to its development. Some of their stories are surprising and truly inspiring, especially those that are representative of all who transformed, survived and thrived in their adopted country. But perhaps what's even more surprising is the common link that united and influenced them all. Join me on a journey through the annals of early European Australia. Do you think a convicted forger could ever be honoured with his face printed on a country's banknote? Well, it actually happened. The first Australian decimal currency $10 note in circulation from 1966 to 1993 had the face of a convict who committed forgery on it. Who was this man? And why is he considered worthy of being remembered with his face emblazoned on a banknote. Francis Greenway was born near Bristol, England in 1777 to a family of builders, stonemasons and architects. Greenway set up an architectural firm in Bristol until his business went bankrupt in 1809. In difficult financial circumstances, in January 1812, Greenway forged a note on a building contract that said the client would pay Greenway an extra 250 pound. Well, the client was not impressed and complained to the authorities, which led to Greenway being convicted and sentenced to death. But this was later commuted to transportation to Sydney for 14 years as a convict. Meanwhile, in the new colony, the New South Wales governor, Lachlan Macquarie, sent a request to England for an architect to help build the new town of Sydney. No architect was sent, but Francis Greenway arrived in Sydney in February 1814 as a convict, and a month later, on March 7, he was granted a ticket of leave by Macquarie, who had been desperate to have an architect design the colony's public buildings. Governor Macquarie appointed him as the colony's civil architect and assistant engineer. His first commission was to build the Macquarie Lighthouse here on South Head at the entrance to Sydney Harbour. Greenway went on to build many significant buildings in the new colony. Some of his works include the obelisk. From this spot, they measured the distances to the various settlements in the colony. Hyde Park Barracks, a home for 600 convicts. St James Church, which held its first service on the 6th of January, 1822. The first court buildings in the colony and the extensions to the new government house and its stables, which are now the Conservatorium of Music. There are still 49 Georgian style buildings in central Sydney attributed to his designs. Greenway even discussed the need for a harbour bridge a century before it was built. Like many freed convicts, Greenway accepted a farming land grant or free land and settled near Maitland. He died of typhoid on his property in 1837 and his remains are believed to rest in an unmarked grave in the East Maitland Cemetery. Greenway's legacy lives on in some of the finest colonial Georgian architecture in Sydney and he is honoured with his face 
etched on the $10 note. A second convict who made an impact on colonial society was William Bland. He was the son of an obstetrician in England and he became a surgeon in the British Navy. In 1809, on the warship HM Hesper in Bombay, India, Dr. Bland got into a fierce argument with another officer, Robert Case. Unfortunately, the two men decided that the only way to resolve the issue was to have a duel with guns. In the duel, Bland killed Robert Case. The surgeon was actually convicted of manslaughter and instead of being hanged, he was sentenced to seven years transportation to Australia. Dr. Bland arrived in Sydney in July of 1814 and was sent to the Castle Hill Jail for a short time. But the next year, he managed to get a pardon and was released and started to make an impact on the colonial society by being part of the building of a nation. In 1817, he set up a successful private medical practice on Macquarie Street. But in 1818, he began writing satires that insulted the governor over his poor treatment of the farmers. Governor Macquarie was not amused and managed to get him convicted of libel. And so Bland ended up in prison again for a few months, this time in the Parramatta jail. Surely that was too much. Surely that was the end. But somehow, William Bland began focusing on a much bigger goal, the building of a nation. William Bland believed in the power of education to build a better society and was the president on the committee that founded the prestigious Sydney Grammar School. He also became involved in New South Wales politics and by 1843, he was elected to the New South Wales Legislative Council. And perhaps the greatest of his achievements was being voted the president of the inaugural Australian Medical Society in 1859. William Bland is also famous as having the oldest surviving photograph taken in Australia in 1845 and is now held by the Mitchell Library of New South Wales. At his death, he was given a state funeral, which isn't a bad achievement for an ex-convict. Surprisingly, there is another convict who can be seen on the Australian currency. Her name is Mary Reby. She was known as Molly Haydock in England and was only 13 years old when she was arrested for stealing a horse in 1790 and sentenced to be transported to New South Wales for seven years. She arrived in Australia in October 1792 and was assigned as a nursemaid in the household of Major Francis Gross. Two years later, when she was 17, she married Thomas Reby. Mary and Thomas moved to a farming property near the Hawkesbury River, north of Sydney. Farming provided new and wonderful opportunities for freed convicts. Mary and Thomas worked hard on the land and became successful farmers. Thomas soon owned a grain carrying business and three boats for transporting coal, cedar and wheat. After his death in 1811, Mary took on the responsibility for the businesses. She expanded the business interests to importing and mercantile, purchased new ships, opened a new warehouse in George Street, the main street of Sydney, and leased her property in Macquarie Place to the first bank in Australia, the Bank of New South Wales. She continued to both build elegant buildings and make extensive investments in Sydney city property. In 1825, she was appointed as one of the governors of the Sydney Free Grammar School, alongside another ex-convict, Dr. William Bland. Mary Reby was enterprising in everything she undertook and became legendary in the colony as the first successful businesswoman. She is known for her active interest in her church, the education of the children, and works of charity for the underprivileged. Mary Reby, a horse thief and one of the youngest convicts sent to Australia, made a difference in a new land. Today, she is honoured by having her face on the $20 Australian banknote.
Our next convict lends his name to the highest ranking high school on academic results of all Australian schools, James Roos Agricultural High School. For the past 30 years, this school based in Carlingford, Sydney, has performed better in the final year exams than all other high schools and private schools in New South Wales. But how did it start? Well, surprisingly, it began as an agricultural or farming school and took its name from a convict who arrived in Australia on the first fleet in 1788. James Roos was born in Launceston, Cornwall in 1760 and worked as a farm hand for most of his childhood. In 1782, at the age of 23, he was tried and sentenced to death for breaking and entering the house of Thomas Olive at night and stealing two silver watches. Luckily, James avoided the death penalty and instead was sentenced to transportation for seven years and placed aboard the first ships to bring convicts to Australia. When it was decided to establish a penal colony in New South Wales, he was sent out with the First Fleet in 1787 on the ship called the Scarborough. James Roos claimed to be the first Englishman to set foot on the shores of Botany Bay in 1788 when he carried the ship's captain, John Hunter, ashore. In July 1789, Roos applied for a land grant that would allow him to take up farming. Governor Philip did not give him a land grant, but permitted him to occupy an allotment at Rose Hill near Parramatta called Experiment Farm. The title to that grant was withheld until Roos showed his capacity as a farmer and his right to freedom had been proved. In his first year after being released, James produced the first successful wheat harvest in New South Wales and proved that it was possible for freed convicts to become self-sufficient farmers and landowners. James Roos married Elizabeth Perry, a fellow convict at Parramatta in 1790 and they successfully farmed their land. A plaque at Experiment Farm commemorates this first independent farm. In February 1791, Roos received 30 acres in land grant number one. And by the end of the year, Roos, his wife and child, no longer needed food from the government store. James Roos died on the 5th of September, 1837. During his last months, he occupied himself with the rather sad task of carving his story on his own tombstone. He is buried in the cemetery of St. John's Church, Campbelltown. So what was this convict's legacy? Well, James Roos was the first full-time farmer in the new colony and established successful methods of farming in a new land. In addition, the eminently successful James Roos Agricultural High School bears his name, keeps traditional farming skills alive in a metropolis and is a testament to his hard work, dedication and commitment. These convicts who sail to an unknown land have remarkable stories of courage and transformation as they worked the land, created a new life and helped to build a new nation. Doesn't that make you wonder, is there a way for any person to really get a new life? If those petty criminals could, surely we can. So how can we find out about one of the key elements of getting a better life? Well, come with me down to the circular key end of Sydney on the corner of Bly and Hunter Streets. In a little square, there's a monument that's passed by and unread by hundreds of people every day. Why is there a monument here? And what does it commemorate? Well, on Sunday the 3rd of February, 1788, a week after the landing of the first ships from England, the first Christian church service was held on Australian soil for the officers, marines and convicts. The service was led by the colony's chaplain, Richard Johnson, on a grassy hill under a tree right near this monument. It's hard to imagine the scene, 
No skyscrapers, no roads or cars, but just 11 ships bobbing in the harbour in the background. Richard Johnson was a man who was convinced that the Bible is the true Word of God and that we should live according to its principles. And so with great love and affection, he called the Marines and convicts alike to have a faith in Jesus and the Bible. Richard Johnson actively worked to improve the lives of the convicts in the colony. He was responsible for the setting up of a fund to care for the orphans. And when the Second Fleet arrived in Sydney with hundreds of sick and dying convicts on board, it was Johnson who risked his own life and health and went into the ships to care for those in need. Also, he and his wife had a special desire to befriend the Aborigines who were being dispossessed of their land by the new white settlers. In addition, Richard Johnson was concerned for the education of all children, whether they belonged to convicts or free settlers, and he became a pioneer in providing education in the new colony. On the 18th of February, 1793, five years after the arrival of the First Fleet, Reverend Johnson and his wife Mary opened the first school in the colony in their newly finished church on the corner of Hunter and Castlereagh streets with about 200 students, which is commemorated today by a plaque. The first generation of colonial children owed their schooling to the influence and efforts of Richard Johnson. They all attended church schools and received a Christian education. He recruited teachers from among the convicts raised funds for their employment, provided reading books and taught lessons himself. He also spent countless hours visiting convicts, distributing spelling books and Bibles and encouraging the illiterate to help the illiterate. What remarkable stories began in this harbour, began with convicts sailing in, and ended with new lives, new identities, and with a new nation growing so dramatically. Doesn't that make you wonder? What made the difference? What had such a huge influence on the early settlement? Well, amongst other things, it was the Christian churches. They assisted people in need and educated the children. They promoted Christian principles and values. They proclaimed the good news of God's unconditional love and helped to turn a penal colony into a progressive nation. They helped turn convicts into upright citizens and gave them a new identity. Christianity proclaims that faith in Jesus is the biggest source of transformation in all of history. It claims Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross can change us more powerfully than anything else. But that doesn't happen automatically. There are challenges. For many people in our world today, the life of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice hasn't come alive. It's a misty event in the past. And here's one big reason. The cross doesn't seem to have their name on it. Many people see the cross in generic terms. Sure, it was something done for humanity, maybe a heroic gesture, but it doesn't have my name on it. I wasn't there. You know, these criminals or convicts who sailed into Sydney Harbour had to have a pardon, a reprieve with their name on it to get their freedom. It had to be legal. Now, the Bible talks about the pardon that Jesus offers each one of us. When Jesus Christ stretched His arms out on the cross, His reach was very wide indeed, even wider than Sydney Harbour, even wider than the Australian continent. Now, you're probably not a convict sailing to another land, but here's where the cross gets personal. We all have problems. The cross is about your problems, your weaknesses, your addictions, your challenges and your feelings of low self-worth. How could Jesus transform us? How do we get a new identity? 
Well, the cross of Christ is about your new identity. The cross has your name on it. It speaks to you personally. It's a message that comes out of the shadows, down through the years, and tells you God loved you then and God loves you now. That's a wonderful message to receive, even in a very secular world. God the Creator holds you in His hands. He holds your unique human identity in His hands. And He held you in His hands when He died. If you would like to make a personal response to God's gift to you, if you would like to find out more about how you can transform your life and find true inner peace and happiness, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the booklet, Does God Really Make a Difference? This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. I guarantee there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or P.O. Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. Be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray and ask for God's blessing and guidance in our lives. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus and for your promise of a new identity, a new life when we believe and trust in you. We need to be redeemed, free from our past problems and challenges. We pray for forgiveness and peace and the assurance of a new identity in Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name, Amen. <music> 